Got All it. Right. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> well, everybody, we've got a smaller group today. I had probably at least eight to 10 emails that said people were taking today as a holiday. And, you know, I don't know, everything's normal in my household. Everybody's doing their thing in terms of schedules for a normal Monday. So, okay. Uh, we've got several new people who were not on our January meeting. So I'm going to go around. Uh, unfortunately, Nathan Slayton, who's on this, is his microphone's not working. So that's Nathan Slayton at the University of Arkansas up there in the corner. He's waving at us. Cool. Uh, Luke, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Luke Gariboni. Uh, I'm the Extension Soil Fertility Specialist at NEC State Raleigh. Very good. Thanks, Luke. Uh, Amy, you weren't on our last one? No, sure. And I have my video off because, of course, I'm trying to shove food in my face during this hour. So, hi, everyone. Amy Schober, a nutrient management and environmental quality specialist at University of Delaware. Uh, Brian, I don't think you were on our last one. Um, yeah, I was here last month, but oh. just uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, Brian Kalmbach, I'm uh, working on our nutrient management program at University of Maryland. Very good, Brian. Uh, Sarah Lyons, I don't know if you were on our last one. Hi, everyone. So I'm not officially a part of this committee. I don't have a lot of experience with liming, but I thought I would sit in as just an educational Very purpose. good. And if you need anything about you know, database information, you can let me know. But Well, I think we're going to be visiting with you that next month and the next one. So yeah. Hi, Hylene, I don't believe you were on last one. Hylene Zong. Hi, Bob. No, I wasn't here, but uh, I'm just uh, want to have an opportunity to learn from you guys. I have done lots of work on liming, aluminum toxicity type of uh, work. Uh, anyway, if anyone does know me, I'm uh, from Oklahoma State University. And then we have one more person who just joined who wasn't on last month, Rao from Florida. Rao? Oh, I, I mean, I, he's not muted, but evidently his microphone's not working. Well, Rao, Rao Marsufa, who was with, uh, he was SPAC president a few years ago, at University of Florida. He's, he's been part of our group since we started. He wasn't at the last meeting. So, well, let's get on schedule here. Uh, so I, I did my introductions of the new people. So as I said last month, one of the things I want to do is establish a foundation so that we kind of have an understanding about the methodologies and the tools in place and soil acidity. So for this meeting, I've asked David Hardy to do a pH presentation. He did such an excellent job at the uh, 2020 ASA meetings that were online from Phoenix. But uh, I think it's really important for us to understand uh, pH is not as simple as what we think it is. So I'm gonna hand it over to David Hardy. David, uh, Steve, you probably wanna let David Hardy sh share his screen. Yeah, you should be able to do that right now. Let's see. Yeah, well, let's see, share screen right here, okay. All right, right there. Okay, right there. Let's see. Hold on. There we go. Everybody see that in the big view? Um, let's see. Um, let me go back and um, let me stop. stop sure. Let me do one more thing here. Let me do this right here. Did y'all see that at all? We seen we seen it when it was up, but it, we're not getting it on your on the screen now. We saw the we didn't see the presentation, but we saw the uh, I don't know what you call it the presenter mode or right. yeah I seen the intro slide. Yeah, uh, let me see if I can find to um, I don't want my notes over there really. There we go. Okay. Hold on one second here. 
Um, I'm not in the best with this stuff. Uh, hey, none of, none of us with older skill sets are. <laughs> okay, can you see that now? We can see that perfectly, David. Okay, all right, very good, all right. So you just see the slides, is that right? Yeah. Okay, all right, cool. Okay, um, so what, what Bob asked me to do is do a similar presentation as, as I did at the ASA meeting, so that's what we have with the slides today for the most part. I did take out a few and I added one or two, I think, or changed a few here or there, but um, this slide was interesting to me because I never had seen it before and I ran across it, I was preparing for the ASA talk. It just gives a global view of soil pH. Um, and you know, in, in the US, we have predominantly our acid soils in the, I guess the most Eastern part, um, some in the Midwest too of the United States. And we go to some of the mildly alkaline soils in the, um, the Western part of the US. So we do have a range of pHs that, that certainly we deal with, certainly in the Southeast part of the US where we have a lot of our lime needs. We have, you know, basically a lot of acid soils to begin with given the parent material. And that acidity reoccurs every Every two or three years after liming given, we have the crop removal and so forth and, and leaching rains um, that occur. I just presented this slide. You ever seen a lot of luminal toxicity? Certainly um, this is a corn plant from some of our lime studies we've had in recent years, um, some lime plots, and you can see the devastation on root growth. And as you all know, we, we certainly need lime and it's a very important aspect of having our production systems. And I, I got a call this morning, true to form, on why the uh, pH is not really responding to last year's lime, and he's getting high lime recommendations this year. So I get a lot of questions, it seems like, on pH and lime. And they continually come in, but I think a little bit less now than what I used to get. The pH methods we use today, um, this came data came from NAPT and ALP. 2020 data, NAP reported five different methods. Um, the one-to-one, -one, talking about soil to water ratios, um, 102 labs, and you can see about one quarter of those labs used the uh, third molar caps from chloride. One-to-two labs, uh, 47 labs, and a little bit lesser percentage used the uh, calcium chloride measurement. There's a few labs using saturated paste. They're probably primarily out west. ALP data set, um, 2020, they had seven methods. Again, one-to-one -one being the predominant across all the different methods with about, again, roughly 25% using the SALT method. One-to-two, 38 labs, somewhat similar as the NAPT program with 42% using the SALT method. I'm not sure why that's the case there, but there are quite a few more labs reporting that in this data set. Then the one to five, which is a little bit extreme ratio, there's three labs using that. Um, I'm not sure who they are, maybe Bob knows. But then the, there are three labs that use a one to one, one normal KCL. And I think that's uh, Kentucky, Frank, I think y'all use that. I'm not sure what the other labs are that, that use that. And saturated paste, probably the same labs as reported in the NAPT data set. So a wide range of methods used across um, the U.S. based on these two programs. The pH analysis we commonly think of today, um, it's usually a two-point calibration using buffers of four and seven. Um, we actually use a 10 buffer in our lab because of a certification we have with the state. So we have a three-point calibration, the 10 buffer, is used oftentimes in alkaline soils out in the western part of the U.S. There are a wide range of equi equilibration times before pH is measured. And they range from just a few minutes up to hours. And I don't really know why we have such a wide range. Um, I looked into our time and asked some of the old timers in North Carolina we used to wait for an hour, but since um, in the past year, we changed that to 15 minutes. And that has helped us greatly in the lab get through samples a lot quicker with 
no really effect on pH. So that's one thing I kind of question while we have the range. Stirring may occur while we read pH. Um, oftentimes we read it in the slurry. There's thinking that that speeds the stability in the reading that's attained with a meter. Um, there are some labs, obviously, that read it in the supernatant. And these are usually labs that run it at a one to two soil to water ratio. Automation has become popular, especially in the last, say, 15 years. So robots are pretty prevalent in labs, especially those running a lot of samples. Um, some labs rinse, some labs don't rinse after reading pH. Um, North Carolina, we're a rinsing lab. There are numerous factors that affect the measurement itself. Um, these are, I don't think this is an all-inclusive list, but if you go back and look and read some of the, um, the articles on pH, you will see many of these addressed in the literature or at least in chapters on pH and some of the main texts we have in soil analysis. Uh, we're gonna focus on the latter three of these today, the junction potential, suspension effect, and salt content. The definition of pH, as you probably all remember um, from way back, whenever you had this in the classroom, the negative log of hydronium ion concentration, you know, that's not really a concentration we're looking at. It's really an activity given the other species that occur and their effects on, on hydrogen in the soil, the way it behaves, so to speak. We're measuring a voltage or an EMF using an electrode system composed of a glass electrode. It has an internal reference electrode, actually a silver silver chloride electrode, and plus an external silver silver chloride. So that's our system we've got, essentially that electrode system. This can be viewed in a diagram, as you see at the very bottom. On the left, you see the external reference electrode being a silver silver chloride electrode. That's where we actually are adding our KCL and silver chloride filling solution. That is joined by a salt bridge where we have a junction potential with our test solution being the, the soil slurry, so to speak, or the soil solution we're, married, we're measuring. Then to the right, we have our glass electrode, which has a hundredth molar HCl with a pH of seven, it's buffered. And inside that electrode, there's also an internal reference silver silver chloride electrode. And that comprises our total system of measuring pH, except for the meter itself. Okay. So in measuring pH, uh, we're looking at using a voltage meter, which actually responds to the proportion of the activity of the solution expressed by the NERST equation that we have here. I'm not gonna go through the, all the ins and outs of the NERST equation, but you can see how they're defined here. I guess it, importantly in this, in this NERST equation, we have temperature. We, hit, we know the reading can depend upon temperature. So we compensate for temperature using a probe. You can see at the very bottom what's referred to as a universal pH equation that you're used to when we have a system calibrated using buffers and what we would actually um, decide of what the final pH of the soil system is. And you'll note that the denominator 0.0591 is often familiar to many of us being 59.1 millivolts equal one pH unit. And Frank, you're, you're the true soil chemist here. So if I misspeak or say something that didn't quite right, you feel free to put me on track because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I don't know this like you know it, so to speak, because you teach it every, every year probably. So feel free to add general correction if needed, okay? <laughs> The combination electrode for pH um, is viewed di with the diagram I have here. And I can barely see my slides, but I can hopefully you can see a bigger picture. But what we have, um, you can see inside this, this body, electrode body, you can see the external reference electrode. And we have a port that we would actually use to fill that with KCL and and silver chloride solution on occasion. 
as it runs down. Then we have a junction that is signified down to the lower right in the slide by that black portion. And that, that joins essentially establishes a circuit between our soul we're analyzing with the electrode system. Then you can see the glass bulb. And inside that glass bulb, we have our internal silver silver chloride reference electrode that we have. Okay. To the right, what I did, I took a close up picture of actually an electrode in the lab. And you can actually see the junction like little fibers there in the red circle. And they're adjacent to the glass bulb. David, can I yes. interrupt? Yes, what sure. If you went to presentation mode, um, Okay, can you see, okay. Is that better? Yeah, and then go up to display settings. Okay. Okay. Uh, and click swap presentation view and slideshow. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, okay. That's what I should have done to begin with, I guess, Frank, and I was trying to figure that out. Maybe y'all can see a bigger picture now. Yeah. Great, David. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks. Thanks for that. So, um, so anyway, you can see the small fibers there that's associated with the junction that actually connects the soil sample with the electrode system. And then to the very far right, you can see I've got a little arrow pointing down to where you can see the, um, the temperature correction probe is what you see there, okay? Now the glass bulb itself is sensing the hydrogen ion concentration or activity. And these glass bulbs are specially designed. So there's, we have an inner and outer gel and that inner and outer gel and what I read and have learned about this is separated by a dry glass plate, okay? So essentially these gels or this glass is doped so to speak, is what I understand it to be. And Frank, you, you chime in here if you need to. But they're doped with cations, primarily. And we're measuring a voltage difference between the outside the glass bulb, the soil system itself, and what's actually inside the glass bulb, which is established and we know. And so in doing that, hydrogen ion itself does not cross the membrane but interacts with these and carries its voltage through that glass membrane by interacting with the cations within that glass. And that's how the voltage is actually sensed, is my understanding. Um, is, is that true to form, Frank, from what's your, what you actually teach? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And and that's something. Well, no. <laughs> but you know, what's that? I haven't taught in about 12 years, so. <laughs> But this is something that actually, this is something that never actually was, never taught to me in, in the classroom, I don't think at all. So, um, so anyway, okay. So what we wind up with, with the calibrated system, either using a two point calibration or three point calibration, we've got pH on the X axis, and then we've got measured millivolts on the Y axis, and certainly our, our, our meter does this for us actually in computing what the pH is, but you can see at a pH of seven, essentially we're sitting at zero millivolts or the lower pHs or acidic pHs, we have positive millivolts and for the more alkaline pHs, we have negative millivolts being measured in the system, okay? The liquid junction or reference electrode we had the flow of potassium and chloride that completes the circuit again for our electrode system. And that, that flow is necessary. The reason potassium and chloride were chosen is because they have equal flow in these systems so they conduct equal amounts of current is why they're chosen. Leakage is necessary. So when you have a faulty electrode or electrode that fails, it's probably coming from having a faulty junction. And that junction can become plugged. It can be plugged, plugged with soil particles or it can become plugged with actually KCO crystals. 
And that's oftentimes what we experience in our labs if we have a faulty pH probe, is probably the junction is probably what's going bad. Um, okay. This slide refers to the liquid junction potential and suspension effect. And essentially, um, the junction potential is dependent upon the mobility and diffusion of the electrolytes through whatever that probe is in, so to speak. And there can be boundaries that affect the electrolyte flow. And if there are boundaries, then it could actually give a big junction potential. The junction potential is always present, but it will vary depending upon the system that that liquid junction is in. So if you, you'll consider these different aspects of what we're doing here, we have calibration buffers A, and we have pretty high salt strengths in those buffers, right? And you have the junction potential that would be in buffered solutions like our buffers four and seven or 10. Then you have in, in B here, we have the junction being placed in the supernatant that would certainly have a different, I would say, suspension of ions as compared to if it was placed actually in the, the soil itself in, in item C. So you can see that, that there are differences in, in what would be the junction potential depending upon the matrix, so to speak, that that junction is placed in. Ideally, we'd like for the junction to be stable and re reproducible, else we can have errors associated with that junction potential. In the next slide, we'll talk more about the suspension effect as, as found in the paper by Sumner. Um, so we have pH measured in a system, and this comes from the paper, Measurement of Soil pH, Problems and Solutions that Malcolm Sumner published in 1994. And basically what he says in the paper is that it doesn't really matter in system A, I've got where the bulb is placed itself. But what does matter and affects pH readings is where the external reference electrode is placed. And that has to do with the, the liquid junction that we, we're using to measure pH. So what he says is if you place the junction in the supernatant versus actually the soil itself, you will have different junction potentials. And that could lead to differences in measuring pH that can be pretty far reaching in differences. So he goes on to show that C and D, you, have, you would have equal voltages being measured irregardless of the placement of the glass bulb since the junction is placed or the reference is placed in the supernatant. In E and E, E and F systems, you would have equal EMS between those two systems because the external reference and the junction is placed in the soil. What he kind of warns of is placing it in the soil itself because of the difference in flow that you would have as the KCL flows from the junction itself. And that could lead to a large error with the junction potential number, so to speak, or that measurement. So what he suggests is certainly placing the reference in the clear supernate is best. Or if, you, if you're if looking, I guess, at a system that you're actually measuring, let's say in a slurry, it would be best to actually use a salt to minimize the junction potential. He goes on to say in the paper that essentially the, the junction potential and the suspension effect can be viewed kind of one and the same. It's kind of what I read is what he says, okay? So hopefully I've made some clarity with that, I hope, and not confusion. Now, some of the more recent papers, and this paper dates back to um, 2010, that, that Bob Miller and Dave Kissel did some work, and this came out, I think, of Dave Kissel having a lot of interest with salt effects on pH measurements. And what they had, 120 soils from the NAT program, 
and they looked at the delta that would be the pH water minus the pH measurement in salt. And that's what the delta is actually on the y-axis you can see there. And then for these different soils, they measured EC one to one. You see the decisimals per meter on the x-axis. And you can see that under low salt strengths, that those pH measurements, the delta can vary from a little bit over one to being, you know, down to like 0.4 or so, um, where you have significant salt strength. And as you decrease salt strength, they found the minimum being about 0 0.07 at a, a seven decisiven per meter um, difference there or, or salt strength. On average, they found, I think, the delta to be around 0.6 for this data set. But you can see the extreme influence that salt strength could have in comparing different measurements on pH between water, deionized water, or using the 100 molar salt. They took this function they developed from figure on the left, and they actually used that along with the calcium chloride pH to calculate a water pH. So what we have on the y-axis here is a calculated water pH plotted against the measured water pH. And you can see a phenomenal fit between the data, R squared of nearly one. And 88% of their soils predicted were within 0.1 pH unit of that measure, which I think is a phenomenal fit. I forgot to mention, if you look on the, the left-hand slide there, where we've got the power function, that 86% of the data are explained by AC. So that's a pretty good relationship. The salt effect we, we know on pH, um, this kind of originated in, in my world based upon interacting with Kissel and his ideas that, um, that maybe we were not getting accurate salt or accurate pH measurements in water under low EC, low CC soil conditions. And he was thinking that was, that was a major concern. And so these data I've got presented here come from some of the work that Kissel published in a communication soil science and plant analysis publication back in 2009. And you can see he worked with a Norfolk soil series and he varied the salt concentration on the x-axis and then measured pH. And you can see the, the great differences that occur as, as those data are shown here. And you can see the 100th molar calcium chloride concentration being about 0.6 units below what it is if it's measured pretty much in deionized water. Now we know as we experience at least samples that are sent into our labs, that there can be varying salt levels depending upon when those samples are sam when those samples were taken. To give you an idea, typically in North Carolina, we would um, have the highest salt strengths probably in the summer, soon after fertilization, and, and that could impact our data with pH as compared to, let's say, samples that came in the wintertime after rainfalls and leaching, that we should have lower salt strengths in our soils. So that was that concern. In the literature, we can see that as salt strength increases, we do find lower pHs but the literature reports no effect on titratable acidity. That's one thing that's, that's in the literature that I find. Now in Dr. Kissel's data, he found with the 1200 soils they looked at in Georgia, that the change in pH between salt versus deionized water ranged from zero to 1.2 units with the median being about 0.7 units. And he found that 30% of the soils, a significant number of soils with a low, C, low EC, possibly had lower pHs that may be an error and were not getting Lyme recommendations, which could be a large concern. So what they did with this idea is they started measuring their pHs in salt. And I think soon thereafter, Frank Secor and his group, they did the same, but they used one normal KCL 
And it took a few years for us in North Carolina to embrace this, but we soon followed what Georgia did. And today we're measuring our pHs in 100 molar calcium chloride solution. Now, why is there a salt effect? Um, basically from what I read, the calcium or another cation could displace aluminum or trivalent aluminum from the soil surface and you could get a lower pH. It could come from junction potential errors in low EC soils. Um, certainly, there, there could be some other differences too that maybe we don't understand today. Um, I'm not sure if we understand everything there is with pH measurements given what we see sometimes today in labs. Now, these are some data that come from North Carolina, and this shows the seasonal fluctuation in soil pH that I just talked about. And what we have here were samples that came from a field where gypsum was applied in the summertime in peanut production. So we sampled this across the 10 months here um, from January through October. You see the month of sampling. We have soil pH on the left x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we have EC plotted one to two, and that's our line in the graph. And you can see we started off in January with a pH around 6.1. And that stayed fairly stable until April and May, possibly with some fertilizer was applied. And then in June, you can see a huge depression in pH as EC went up. And that was related to gypsum application, calcium sulfate being applied. And then you can see as we go from July to October, pH actually swung up. And probably that was due to some of the gypsum being taken up by the plant, decreasing salt in the soil, and also possibly some rainfall. So this is the seasonal fluctuation that we could experience in low EC soils that could ultimately affect our lime recommendations in the end. One aspect of using, I think, a salt method of pH in the lab compared to water method is the speed and equilibration we see. And these are some data that came from North Carolina where I took simply a play sand that has a very low salt strength. The pH in salt was measured at 4.2 and water was measured at 4.7. So what I've done here, I plotted PS, PHS and PHW, S is for salt, W is for water measurement at, at three different time periods of measurement, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and 60 minutes with the different bars. And we measured the time and we did this in triplicate. It actually took for the electrode or the meter to achieve stabilization and for us to take a pH measurement. On the average, it, it's about three, three seconds faster, three to five seconds faster. And when you do thousands of samples a day, that three to five seconds faster can make huge differences in the lab. So this is a much more stable, quicker way of measuring pH compared to, I would say, the water method. The other thing that we've noticed in North Carolina, but is well represented with this ALP data set, these are three soils that Bob has shared data for me with. And you can see on the left, the differences in laboratories where the pH is measurement is made in water compared to the right side where it's made in salt. Look at the variability in the noise in the left-hand slide compared to where it's measured in salt. We've always said in North Carolina, based upon my experience in a lab, when we were measuring in water, we were good plus or minus 0.2. With the salt measurement, we're good plus or minus, I'd say at least 0.1, if not better. So I think we have a certainly a most more robust measurement in a salt compared to a water measurement. So the considerations in pH analysis that I kind of leave you with, it's a very simple measurement, but we know there's a lot of complexity in analytical procedures given we're in a soil system. There can be a rather significant error, I think, given the junction potential, depending upon how that pH is measure, measured whether it's in a salt system or not. We know that AC affects the measurement. 
We know that there can be an importance of where the electrode is placed, especially that external reference electrode. The salt measurement reduces the junction potential. It normalizes varying salt content that can occur in samples that are taken in low EC soils, depending upon fertilization. You kind of level the playing field out. No matter when that sample is taken, you'll get a, a much more accurate, I think, and re reproducible pH measurement. It's a very robust measurement of pH. It improves your precision. It increases the speed in which we can take a measurement. Every lab is different as far as the client base they face or have. So that's a decision they'll have to make if they want to make a change to going to salt measurement pH. But for us, it's been a very good change for us to have done. Considerations on pH analysis further. Um, and we haven't done this, but if you really wanted to kind of fine tune, I guess, where you are in the lab, you may want to explore getting buffers that have the same EC or salt strength as what you have in, in, in your, at least in your, in your calcium chloride solution, I think is what I'm trying to say there. Most public labs have used uh, water pH measurements for many years, but have gone to the salt method, as I mentioned. And most of the labs I know of, or all the labs I know of, actually had reported adjusted water pH that's 0.6 units higher and what we measure in salt is what the adjustment, how we make it is. Um, there may be no real reason to change methods for some labs, but most private labs, at least those in the Southeast, both offer a water pH method plus a salt. And those in North Carolina that actually are kind of duplicating our analysis from the NCDA side, probably using the salt method plus adding 0.6 to get the um, adjusted water pH. Just some selected references. And if, if you really want to dive into this, um, these are good reads. And, and they go back to some of the, the earlier literature that Peach published in 1953 to some of the more recent literature that, um, that Bob Miller and Dave Kissel and certainly the Sumner article here is a very good uh, paper to look at too. Uh, very insightful. So that's what I have today. And hopefully I've, I've maybe made some clarity with pH measurements and use a better understanding and maybe not added to confusion or, or maybe I have added to confusion, but, um, but anyway, that's what I have for you today. So any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer. Yeah, time for some questions, people chime in. And Frank, did everything come out as you would, um, is everything kosher from a chemistry standpoint from? Yes, it, it was very well presented. So what, what justification do some of these larger private labs um, give that are still holding on to the water method? Because that's the way they've always done it. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I don't know them all per se, but I can tell you a lot of them don't want to change because that's what the client's always seen. And they feel, how should I say, uncomfortable putting out, quote, an estimated water pH. But I think David's experience, I think David Kissel's experience both point that it, it works out even better. It does. And, and we've seen it with growers that are, yeah. you know, we, we, we see a lot of acid, you know, toxicity, aluminum toxicity, and they go back to, well, my pH was 6.0. I don't understand. I'm like, well, you sent your samples to Waters Lab and they do the water method. And, and, even, and that's something that's hard for people to understand. Even though pH is on the report from the two labs, they don't realize that one lab used a different method. Yeah. So. I, I definitely feel like, I get less calls today than what I did before we went to the salt method. I get less questioning of our pH measurements and our lime recommendations than what I did before. Um, not to say I don't, and I got a call today again from a client that he's questioning, you know, why he needs so much lime. And I've got to explore that a little bit more with him once we get through with this presentation today. 
but um, I feel much more comfortable what we're doing today than what I did when I originally started in the lab using a water measurement. Um, I feel a lot, a lot better with what we do. David, so, do you uh, report uh, salt pH or water equivalent pH? Adjusted water pH based on that 0.6 addition to the salt pH. Okay, is that uh, how other laboratory using salt pH reporting the results? Georgia is, I'm sure, yes. Yeah, we, we add the 0.6 and just, we, don't, we just call it pH though, we don't want to confuse people. So, so David, you've got a question in the chat for the comparison of the three soils, is there a short story for what is driving the differences in variability? It was just nice a, a couple slides back looking at those three different soils and it, it kind of these here. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I don't know if folks remember off the top of their head that year for 2105 compared to a, a more well-behaved 2102, but. Um, so, so these are three soils from different parts of the United States. I only, I mean, we submit five, but we only put three on here to keep the graph clean. But, but 2102, and we've sorted both sets of data, the water pH and the salt pH, we've sorted them from the lowest reporting lab to the highest reporting lab for the 2102, the most acid of the, of the three soils presented there. Uh, you know, they're just endemically different soils from different locations. I mean, I could look it up real quick and tell you what they were, you know, in terms of textures and where they came from. But I mean, I picked these out because these ones, we had a truly acid soil there, you know, the anything that falls below 4.5 probably had a pretty significant aluminum associated with it, so. Yeah, and I think aluminum is really buffering it well at that lower pH resulting in tighter data. And the EC but, might be different between the three soils, which would affect. Yes. And, and, and we do notice that when you get into the alkaline soils, which probably come from the Western US, which have more soluble salts associated with them. Yeah, you should expect less variability there. The, the thing that strikes me is if you look at the error bars on 2105 on the left, and then you look at the error bars on 2105 on the right, the inherent within laboratory variability just tightens up tremendously. Really interesting, thank you. More questions? Some look, things look, that... uh, go ahead. Something that I wasn't quite sure on, and can you repeat this was, what? so when you have a single integrated pH probe, were you saying that it's better to run it in the supernatant for taking your measurement or having like a stir bar so your soil particles are all suspended or you let it settle and, and you keep it in the soil? I, I got confused on that part on what's the best actual way to, to actually measure your soil pH. Well, according to what, and this is based on what Sumner says, you know, essentially, you know, the, the best thing to do is to measure in the supernatant. But I think to do that, you have to have a one to two soil to water ratio to do that. Now, he, he does kind of, he does have a comment in his paper referring to reading pH in a slurry, I guess, stirred or the stirring effect as being kind of a downside of reading pH. Um, I haven't been able to, I think I look for, I guess, information on reading pHs in slurry stirred in the literature, but I couldn't find any, any data or any papers as related to that. But he did comment that there was concern about, I guess, the, the data that you would attain from reading in a stirred slurry. Um, now that, you know, his, his best way <clears throat> to measure pH would be in the supernatant if you took what Sumner said in his paper. But, I but think again, that, that yeah, I think that effect goes away if you're measuring salt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah. I, I, Frank, I would say, I don't think it goes away, but it's mitigated to a large point, right? I, I don't think it is. So, so I can tell you a lot of the commercial labs, if you'll notice in the ALP data set are going to one to two salt. 
And the reason they do it is, is that when they use 10 grams of soil and 10 mils of water, and they mix that, it's it, the containers that they're mixing, they're measuring the pH in are pretty wide. And so they end up with the probes barely into the, into the suspension. And, and I know the labs that are switching, they make a note that their electrodes last a lot longer than a one to two, because they're not down in that bottom getting ground off. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, for those, for those of us with robots that are reading with robots, having certainly that, that electrode, making sure it's measured if you've got three electrodes on your machine, making sure it's the same depth in the, all your samples and to make sure you're certainly covering the bulb and your junction very well, you will get, you will get a lot more consistency across your samples that you're measuring. We still have a few handheld stations in the lab, and, um, but we have pretty good reproducibility, I think, when we compare our results with them too, compared to the robot as a whole. But um, I, I didn't know if any labs were actually in the southeast or in our group or any, is anybody measuring in a supernata? No. There, there's some folks at East Carolina University doing wetlands work and mostly more ecology and I think they're doing a little bit of everything. Um, so more, more methods to consider. I, I can double check and see what folks are doing if they're more supernatant or, or more slurry, but um, a lot of low pH work for sure, so. Well, well, the reason I wanted to have David make this presentation is, is that, you know, what we have to realize is that instrument that we're using to make sure pH, the ion selective electrode, it has its limitations. And the, the, fact, the fact that EC of that supernate has such bearing on the results really, I think a lot of people miss. And I think it's very important to get consistency with that. You know, just as one last sidebar, conversations with David Kissel years ago about why he decided to investigate this was, he noted that in Georgia soils, whenever a hurricane went through that state of Georgia, all the pHs in the lab went up that year <laughs> because that all that water leached out the salts that it accumulated. And his biggest issue was the farmer who, you know, uh, limed his field in the spring and then they had a dry summer and the pHs all went down. The farmer says, well, see there, lime, lime doesn't pay. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, okay, I, I go say, ahead, Frank. Yeah, you know, same as what David said. I don't receive a lot of calls from uh, extension agents and producers out there, but the special soil specialists that do, they have said that their number of calls asking questions why pHs are different from fall to spring has greatly decreased since we moved to salt pH. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, less confusion on there on seasonal fluctuations about the salt pH. And okay. we did something a little different. We, we measured in one molar potassium chloride instead of 0.01 molar. And there's reasons for that uh, associated with the buffer measurement. And I could get into that uh, next month's presentation. That's why these all nice dovetail together, Frank. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we're coming up on the limitations of time. Uh, you want to Steve, you want to bring it back up the uh, everybody's square on here, and uh, we'll go over the last couple items on the agenda. Sure, David, I'll have to stop sharing for that. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, there you go. Very good. Okay, so we've had our pH presentation discussion. Uh, I was going to do an overview in the project, but I think I'll leave that because we got limitations on time. Uh, the last two things I want to discuss is I would like to do for a future presentation. I mean, uh, Frank has agreed that he will make a discussion of the buffer present buffer methodologies at the next meeting. But I, for that meeting or a follow up meeting after that, I'd like to do a presentation just to compare comparing what we have for Lyme recommendations across our group. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to send out some data or pH 
and buffer pH by multiple pH methods, multiple buffer methods. I would like each one of the people who represents a land grant university in the group, take a look at your, your uh, calibration data you have and tell us what the Lyme recommendation would be for these particular conditions. I'm gonna keep it very simple, two or three soils, no more than that. And we'll, we'll state you know, the depth of Lyme application and the quality of Lyme being used just to kind of normalize those variables. And I will be sending that out the uh, next couple of days so we can start, I give everybody at least a few weeks to try and compile that data. Um, so the next session, we'll have Frank make a presentation about the buffer methods. Uh, John Spargo and Sarah are gonna show us a real brief presentation on what the uh, survey results are for what the lab industry is using in terms of the land grant universities, the public labs are using for pH and buffer pH methods. So we just have a handle on what, what that variability is across all the locations. Uh, so we can, the last point here is uh, talk about the March meeting schedule. Now I have a conflict on the 21st of March. I like, I like the third, third Monday of the month, but I have a conflict. I'm out of town for three days. Um, it's, it's spring break in Colorado and I've got plans to go to California and do some work out there. Um, what does the 14th work if, if that works for people or the, op, the other date is the 28th? I wanna hold to the Mondays. 28th works better for me. 28th of March? Yes, yeah. 28th of March. Well, I hear nothing negative on the 28th of March and I, and I hear some reservations on the 21st. So I guess we'll make it for the 28th and we'll go from there. Very good. Bob, uh, I make a suggestion on collecting data on recommendations that we have for your three soils. Are you gonna use something like Google Docs? Make we can like do that. I can put it, I put it up on Google Docs. I'll put the data into a Excel spreadsheet yeah. And we'll post it on Google Docs. That sounds like a great idea. Was this presentation recorded? Yes. Yes, Ed, uh, it was recorded. Because I'd like to make it available to some of the other people on our faculty. Well, the other thing is I we got to keep these things recorded because there's a lot of people that weren't on today. And I want to make sure everybody has access to this for this information. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, I, I got to tell you, you know, it's one of those things I for years thought pH, well, okay, that's simple, we'll move on. But when I got working with David, it's a lot more sophisticated. And, you know, it's all comes down. If you got a poor tool, <laughs> you can't do a good job. And I think what David Kissel's done, what David Hardy's done, what Frank has done has shown us that, you know, there's, we got to know what the limitations are of the tools we use. So, Okay. Yeah, uh, real, real quick, I Ed, I just dropped, uh, I think it was Ed that made that comment. Um, I just dropped the meeting minutes in the chat. And okay. uh, I will, once um, the recording is posted, I will link it to there. Um, I can email that to Bob too, because Bob, it sounds like you need to do some follow-up uh, emails in terms of um, getting data collected. So, yeah. Yeah, what I'll do, what I'll do, uh, Steve, is I will put together this Excel spreadsheet and then I'll pass it to you because you've got everything set up on Google Docs and then I'll let everybody know where it's at. So, sounds great. good deal. Okay. Well, everybody, I guess I'll see you in five weeks on the 28th of March. Thanks, Bob. Very good. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Th thanks, David. The great presentation. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.